All right, hi guys. Um, in this video, we are going to start the chapter on blood and uh, get through uh, a few kind of overview topics and talk about red blood cells and their structure and hemoglobin. Uh, so let's start by discussing the functions of blood. So it has three kind of main functions. Uh, the first one is the one you're probably most familiar with. That would be transportation, right? So it transports um, everyone kind of automatically thinks of the blood as transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide, which is definitely true. Um, however, it also transport wa transports waste products, so cellular waste um, from different metabolic processes that you'll be learning about and the breakdown of certain molecules. Uh, those waste products are transported in the blood. Also, it's going to transport nutrients. So from the food that we eat in the stomach, those nutrients are absorbed uh, and transported in the blood to be processed uh, in the liver and taken to all the tissues that need it. And then also, we just learned in the last chapter, one other important thing transported in the blood would be hormones. Okay, so a lot of transport going on with the blood. The blood also functions in regulation. So the blood is going to regulate a few different things. It has a few different regulatory functions. So first of all, it's gonna regulate uh, body temperature. And so we know that blood vessels can constrict and dilate uh, in order to send more blood to certain areas um, or pull blood away from others. And so that'll help to regulate uh, body temperature through that dilation and constriction of those blood vessels uh, because blood is naturally warm and so when it goes to you know areas of the body that will warm uh, that area okay also blood regulates pH because we know pH is maintained in a very specific range so 7.35 this is pH of the blood to 7.45 all right, and so it's maintained there by the activity of buffers. And so hopefully in AMP1 you learned the buffer system most prevalent in the blood. That's the bicarbonate carbonic acid buffer system. And so that'll help to maintain the pH of the blood. And then lastly, the blood functions to regulate uh, fluid levels. All right, so fluid volume. We're going to learn there's a plasma protein in the blood called albumin. Uh, and so albumin functions to pull water into the blood and away from kind of the outside of the tissues, the interstitial space. And so that albumin will kind of help to manage fluid levels in, uh, in the body. Okay. So that's regulation. And then blood also has a protective function. So uh, one part of that protection comes from uh, the protection against infections. All right, so that would be the white blood cells in blood. And then also uh, protection from blood loss. So blood has, uh, as I'm sure you know, the ability to clot. And so that would help to prevent blood loss. So we'll learn about clotting and how it works at the end of this chapter. Okay, so those are the functions of blood. Now let's talk about the composition of blood. What makes up blood? So we know blood, you learned in AMP1, is a connective tissue. That means it consists of scattered cells, ground substance, and fibers. All right, so the cells in blood would be red blood cells and white blood cells. All right, we can also find platelets, but platelets are not actual cells. They're little cell fragments, so they don't really count as one of our scattered cells. Those would be red blood cells and white blood cells. Okay, and then the ground substance in the blood is going to be plasma. All right, we'll talk about the composition of plasma. It is mostly water, but it has some other uh, ions and um, things like that, and so we'll talk about that in a moment. And then the fibers in blood uh, are only present during clotting. All right, and then as I said, we'll talk about clotting at the end of this chapter, so you'll learn uh, what those fibers are that are involved in clotting. Okay, so only present during clotting. 
All right, so when we refer to blood and its composition, uh, we refer to, uh, first of all, whole blood, okay? And so whole blood consists of the plasma and essentially everything else, which we refer to as formed elements. All right, so the plasma and its formed elements, and that would make up whole blood. Okay, so let's talk about plasma first and kind of the composition of plasma. Um, for whole blood in the body, there's about five liters on average in the human body. Okay, so with plasma, that is again, like we said, the kind of fluid in the blood, right? It's that ground substance in the blood. So when you take a sample of blood and you centrifuge it in a tube like this, so that just means that you're gonna spin it really fast and then the heavier things are gonna be um, sent to the bottom, right? Because of that spinning force. So all of the cells will collect here at the bottom. And so then this, what's left on top, the yellow part is gonna be the plasma, okay? And so plasma is mostly water, all right? So it is 90% water, all right? And it has some solutes dissolved in that fluid, okay? So for the solutes, it's gonna contain uh, some electrolytes. So electrolytes, these would be um, ions like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Those are definitely gonna be present in plasma. The plasma does also have uh, some dissolved gases We'll talk about transport of those gases and um, for both oxygen and carbon dioxide, they are transported to some degree dissolved in the plasma, although not nearly as much as say oxygen being carried by hemoglobin, but there is some dissolved in the plasma. All right, and so then also nutrients would be in the plasma. So these would be things like, um, amino acids, glucose, um, vitamins maybe from like the food we eat and absorbed in the GI tract, that would be in the blood. If it's water soluble, it would be dissolved in the blood. All right, so that would be in the plasma. And then we said there's also some waste products. Those waste products would be part of uh, the plasma. And so these will be things like urea, and ammonia, okay? And so these would be um, byproducts of the breakdown of um, proteins, so amino acids, as well as DNA. So when we break those down to use them uh, for energy, all right, or just, you know, because we have a lot and the body doesn't need it, so it's being broken down, um, the byproducts of those processes will be urea and ammonia. So that would be in the plasma. Okay, also in the plasma, we have plasma protein. So these, this first group was solutes, all right? And so um, we also have plasma proteins uh, in the plasma. The first one is albumin, okay? And so albumin is a protein uh, that is made by the liver, all right? So it's made by the liver and its job, its function, what it does is it pulls water into the blood vessel, right, towards itself. So if it's in the plasma, it's gonna be in the blood vessel, all right, and it's gonna pull water towards itself, so into that blood vessel. It attracts water, okay? And so that's gonna to help to um, prevent water from leaking out of the blood vessels, all right? So it's gonna keep it in um, the blood and kind of help maintain that fluid balance, okay? And so we refer to that kind of fluid balance as maintaining the osmotic pressure of the blood. And so this is just the pressure needed, all right? So pressure uh, needed to prevent water from moving. Okay, so it's that pressure needed from albumin pulling in um, and that water wanting to leave, all right, 
that's going to keep water from moving. So you need that albumin to be pulling water in, otherwise it would be lost. Okay, so it's going to maintain that osmotic pressure, that pressure that keeps water from leaving the blood vessels. Okay. Um, anything else I wanted to say? Oh, so kind of on the topic of osmotic pressure, all right, um, albumin maintains osmotic pressure. Uh, and so there, it is possible to lose albumin. And so we'll talk about this again with the urinary system later. But if someone has kidney damage, um, the function of the kidneys in making urine is to filter the blood all right, and form urine from it. And so if there's damage to the kidney, you end up with these big holes where um, small things like you know urea and ammonia were supposed to be able to get through but now it's big enough for a protein like albumin to get through and so albumin can be lost in the urine and what would happen then is this osmotic pressure is out of balance all right and so you won't have that albumin pulling water in so water will seep out of the blood vessels and you'll end up seeing with a patient like that um, edema right, in their extremities because they don't have that albumin to maintain that osmotic pressure. Okay, also another plasma protein uh, would be globulins. Okay, so globulins are um, the kind of big category of globulins will be antibodies. All right, so antibodies um, like you have to fight different infections and viruses and that kind of thing that will be in the plasma and the globulins also refer to uh, transport proteins so we know that nonpolar things things are, that are kind of fatty in nature uh, need help traveling in the blood okay and so globulins these plasma proteins are uh, capable of surrounding fatty things to allow them to be transported in the blood. Those would be transport proteins. So these would be for nonpolar molecules that can't just dissolve in the blood. Okay, and then lastly, our last plasma protein is fibrinogen, all right? And so this is kind of what we were talking about with the fibers that are not visible until clotting occurs. So one of those fibers is fibrinogen. So it is fibrinogen when it is dissolved in the plasma and it is not visible. Okay, so no clotting is happening. Happening, sorry. So this is a clotting protein. All right, so that's one of those we're going to talk about when we talk about uh, blood clotting, all right, and kind of wound healing. Okay, so that is the plasma, all right, and so then aside from the plasma, so this part here would be the plasma, all right, and so then we have the, the part on the bottom here, the red part, this would be where you would find all of your red blood cells. So if we centrifuge blood, all of the red blood cells, they're gonna be heaviest, so they're gonna to go to the very bottom. And then there will be a very thin layer just on top of that. Um, that is referred to as the buffy coat. Okay. And so that buffy coat is gonna contain white blood cells uh, and platelets. Okay, so these are white blood cells and these little um, jaggedy looking guys would be platelets. Okay, there we go. All right, and so when we centrifuge blood, we frequently do it to get what is called a hematocrit. All right, and so uh, a hematocrit is um, basically a measure of the percentage of blood that is red blood cells okay and so we'll just write that really quick all right so the percentage of blood that is red blood cells so then you could actually centrifuge this and measure it like with the ruler and get the percentage and you would have this patient's hematocrit, 
All right? And so um, let's talk about some kind of average numbers for hematocrits. So hematocrits generally are between 38 and 55 percent. All right, so generally around half or a little less than half of blood is made up of red blood cells. Okay, and so those numbers, when we break them down a little more, vary um, based on gender. Okay, so males Typically, their range would be between 42 and 55 percent, and that is because uh, they have testosterone, and so testosterone promotes the production of uh, red blood cells, and so they're going to have uh, naturally a slightly higher hematocrit because of that. And so then the range for females is going to be uh, between 38 and 50. Okay, all right, so that is on a hematocrit. Okay, all right, so now let's talk about formation of blood cells. Okay, and so the fancy scientific word for formation of blood cells is hematopoiesis. All right, so this just means that we are forming blood cells. This, so hematopoiesis could refer to any type of blood cells, right? So just blood cells in general. You could be making white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets. Uh, hematopoiesis is very general. If we want to be more specific, we could say erythropoiesis, right? That would be uh, the formation of red blood cells, okay? Because red blood cells um, are also called erythrocytes okay so erythrocytes uh, red blood cells so that would be erythropoiesis or if we're specifically making white blood cells we would call that um, leukopoiesis all right so forming white blood cells all right and that's because um, white blood cells are also referred to as leukocytes. Okay. Okay, and so both of these processes, so erythropoiesis, leukopoiesis, so hematopoiesis in general occurs in uh, the red, uh, blah, 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 sorry, the red bone marrow. Okay, so remember red bone marrow is in that spongy bone and the ends of long bones and in some of the flat uh, bones. Okay, so in our red bone marrow, that's where all the hematopoiesis is going on. So specifically right now, we're going to focus on erythropoiesis and then a little later when we talk about white blood cells, we'll go through uh, leukopoiesis. Okay, so for erythropoiesis, we are going to start with um, a hematopoietic stem cell, or another name for it is a hemocytoblast. All right, I like hematopoietic stem cell because uh, a stem cell, it kind of tells you what the cell does, right? So a stem cell, by definition, is kind of an immature cell that has the ability to, um, we say, differentiate or kind of like become, grow into, uh, it, any kind of number of cells it wants to. Okay, so this hematopoietic stem cell is a immature cell that could become either a red blood cell, a white blood cell, or uh, the cell that makes platelets. Okay, so it is a immature blood cell, a hematopoietic stem cell. And there are other types of stem cells for all the, you know, different tissues in the body. Uh, these specifically are for blood cells, okay? So we start with our hematopoietic stem cell, um, and we'll just make a note here, right? So it can become any blood cell, all right? And so that means, again, red blood cell, white blood cell, or the cell that generates platelets. In this case, we're talking about red blood cells. So the first thing it would do, um, it goes through a process that you don't need to know about, 
and becomes a reticulocyte. Okay, and so a reticulocyte is kind of the immediate precursor to a red blood cell. It's like the step right before a red blood cell. So there are many steps in between, all right, but this would be the precursor right before a red blood cell. Whoops, okay. All right, and so these reticulocytes um, typically take 15 days to develop uh, from that hematopoietic stem cell. So in 15 days, you'll have these reticulocytes. Uh, they're already looking kind of like uh, red blood cells. They have no nucleus, like our red blood cells. And they can enter the blood, okay? And so they're basically kind of membrane sacs full of hemoglobin, very similar to red blood cell. All right, and so they enter the blood and in about two days, they become red blood cells. All right, so they can enter blood. All right, two days to uh, become a red blood cell. All right, or our erythrocyte, okay? Uh, and so the reason I'm pointing this out is because if, you know, you have a patient and you look at their blood and you notice there's a high amount of reticulocytes, you might, um, you know, wonder why this would mean that they have an increased red blood cell production, right? So is there a reason that they're producing more red blood cells? Okay, so you see a lot more reticulocytes when that person's uh, red bone marrow is actively making new red blood cells. Uh, kind of at a more accelerated rate. Okay, and then here's the uh, erythropoietin. So we had this in our last chapter. So this would be a hormone. So hopefully you remember it is a hormone made by the kidneys. All right, and it functions to promote or increase red blood cell production. All right, good, okay. Um, and so what happens is the kidneys will sense uh, low oxygen levels in the blood, and so they'll release erythropoietin in response so that you can make more red blood cells um, and make sure that the tissues are well oxygenated. All right, and so the last topic we're gonna cover in this particular video is gonna be erythrocytes. So we're gonna talk about um, uh, their structure and hemoglobin and hemoglobin structure and um, actually we'll get into and discuss anemias and the different type of anemias and then we'll stop there. Okay, so with erythrocytes, they are biconcave. Okay, so when you look at a red blood cell from the top down, all right, they're going to look kind of like this. They're going to look like little red or pink donuts and so generally there be very light in the middle and that's because when you look at them from the side right they kind of indent in the middle that's what they mean by biconcave right so it's concave on both sides and so this plasma membrane comes very close right to this plasma membrane and there's very little cytoplasm in between so that's why it usually looks very pale in the middle kind of like a donut there's not actually a hole in the red blood cell all right it just looks like it because there's so little cytoplasm in that area okay so they're biconcave uh in shape okay so that me just means that they are depressed in the middle, all right? So from either side, okay? And so essentially um, the red blood cell it has no nucleus, all right? And it is just like a sac of plasma membrane um, full of hemoglobin, all right? That's its job. Its job is to carry hemoglobin. It has no nucleus or mitochondria. 
All right, if you think about it, that makes sense. All right, so if it's the job of a red blood cell to carry oxygen on hemoglobin, how counterproductive would it be if they also had mitochondria that required oxygen in order to, you know, break down food and um, make ATP, right? So it would just be using the oxygen that it's transporting, and that would not be very uh, advantageous, okay? So no nucleus, uh, no mitochondria, mainly just hemoglobin. Okay, all right, so <clears throat> let's look at hemoglobin, all right? So this would be a bunch of little hemoglobin molecules if we enlarge one of those uh, hemoglobin molecules, we can see that it consists of these four. So hemoglobin is made up of, as a protein part, and it has kind of the heme part, okay? So it's made up of four uh, separate protein kind of structures. So we have these two dark blue ones, and then these two kind of teal ones here and here, okay? And those are called globin chains, all right? And globin chains are uh, proteins, okay? And there are four, we call them subunits. There's four subunits. Those are separate, if you remember from AMP1, those are separate tertiary structures held together. So this would make a quaternary structure for hemoglobin, okay? And so there are two types, right, the dark blue and the teal. Uh, those are gonna be the alpha uh, and the beta uh, subunits, right? So we have two alpha subunits, and we have two beta subunits. Okay? And they're made of protein, so that means, you know, amino acids strung together, all of that good stuff, all right? And so then each subunit contains a single heme, okay? And so heme is um, a pigment in hemoglobin. It gives it, uh, give it its color, all right? So it's the pigment. And there's one for each subunit. And then bound in the middle, all right, so that would be these like yellow guys here. And bound in the middle is an iron molecule, all right, so each binds one iron. Okay, and the iron is actually the reason that red blood cells are red, okay, and so iron. I'll put that in parentheses, right, just in case you don't remember that's the abbreviation for iron. Iron is what causes things to rust, right? And so uh, what happens is um, it gives blood that kind of red color, especially when it binds to oxygen, it gets this bright red color uh, that's from that iron, okay? And so the iron directly binds oxygen. All right, so each iron can bind one oxygen. So that means, right, each hemoglobin molecule, because they have one, two, three, four iron molecules, each subunit has one in each of the hemes. Uh, so each hemoglobin can bind four oxygens, okay? So if on the exam I were to ask you how many oxygen can be bound by 10 hemoglobin, you would tell me, hopefully, 40, right? Because each hemoglobin can bind four oxygen molecules, okay? All right, so then just to kind of summarize that, right? So hemoglobin, we have our globin chains, alpha and beta, all right? We have um, four of those, one, two, three, four, each of them contains a heme molecule with a iron in the middle, and that iron can bind one um, oxygen each. Okay, so that's our hemoglobin. All right, um, a little bit about the red blood cell. 
uh, just some of its kind of characteristics that are interesting. So he said it doesn't have um, any uh, mitochondria or nuclei, right? 90%, sorry, 97% um, of the cell is hemoglobin, all right? And there's some water kind of in there too. Red blood cells are also very flexible, all right? And that's because um, some capillaries are smaller than an actual red blood cell, okay? So red blood cells, on average, uh, the diameter, okay, of a red blood cell is, on average, seven to eight micrometers, all right? And the smallest capillaries uh, can be around uh, four micrometers in diameter. Okay, so it's important that that red blood cell kind of be able to like fold itself and bend and they can kind of fold in half like that if they need to, um, to squeeze through those tiny capillaries. And it's actually, that's by design because when they go through those tiny capillaries, that's where gas exchange occurs. And so you want that red blood cell to be right next to the wall of the capillary. So there's not much distance for um, gas exchange to happen, right? There's a very small diffusion distance. Okay, so that's the red blood cells. Um, here's a few terms for hemoglobin and kind of the state of hemoglobin. So if hemoglobin is uh, bound to oxygen, we call that oxyhemoglobin, right? So this would be um, hemoglobin. with oxygen bound, okay? And so it takes on that bright ruby red color when oxygen is bound. Deoxyhemoglobin would just be uh, hemoglobin without oxygen bound. Okay, and then lastly is uh, carbaminohemoglobin, okay? And so with this 20% of the CO2 that's transported in the blood uh, is transported bound to carbon dioxide, or sorry, bound to hemoglobin. Uh, and so 20% so of carbon dioxide transported is bound to specifically the globin part of hemoglobin, right? Is bound to the uh, the globin chains. Okay, bound to globin. All right, and so when the globin chains have carbon dioxide bound, we call that carbamino hemoglobin. All right, so carbamino for the carbon dioxide, it's bound to the amino acids of that globin chain, okay, and hemoglobin, obviously, because we're talking about hemoglobin. Okay, all right, so a couple more terms. So polycythemia is a term that refers to uh, too many red blood cells. Okay, and so with this, you would see a higher hematocrit, right? So you'd have a higher percentage of red blood cells in the blood. Uh, so that would be an increase in hematocrit. Right? And that can change the viscosity of the blood, right? If you have a lot of red blood cells, that can make it more uh, thick, which can be dangerous because thick blood is not going to move through blood vessels very easily, okay? So, you know, polycythemia um, can be, uh, you know, a dangerous thing if it is very, very severe, okay? And then also anemia. So we're about to talk about uh, a few different kinds of anemia, but by, uh, by definition is a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. All right. And so there obviously can be, that's a very general uh, term, right? And so there can be different types of anemia.
All right, before we talk about types of anemia, I just wanna mention uh, when red blood cells are broken down, all right? So they only live um, about 120 days in circulation, okay? And so once they're old and they've passed their prime and they need to be broken down and gotten rid of, right? They don't have mitochondria or nuclei, so they don't live forever. Okay, um, they're going to be broken down and we'll talk about with hemoglobin what happens to each component. Alright, so with hemoglobin, uh, the liver is going to recycle the iron for it, right from it. Alright, so this is going to be recycled by the liver. Okay, because we need that to make more hemoglobin. Uh, heme is that pigment, so heme is broken down into what is called bilirubin okay and so bilirubin is added to bile by the liver all right and so then that can be excreted um, into the digestive system and gotten rid of as a type of waste all right and we said globin is made of protein so this is broken down to individual um, amino acids and then those amino acids can be uh, reused and recycled to make other proteins. Okay, so these would be reused. All right, so now let's talk about the different types of anemia, and this will be the last topic for this video. Okay, so anemia, we said, was reduced oxygen-carrying capacity uh, of the blood. So a few common symptoms uh, with different types of anemia would be fatigue, all right? So someone would feel very uh, tired, not a lot of energy because their tissues aren't getting a lot of blood. Uh, they could be very pale, all right? They could be short of breath. That's a natural response of the uh, respiratory system. When your tissues aren't getting enough oxygen, it will increase the respiratory rate to try to get more oxygen to the tissues. And they also may uh, feel cold, all right? So they may feel like chilly. Okay, all right, so let's talk about our different types. So the first category is um, anemia associated with blood loss. And so really there's one type and that would be hemorrhagic anemia. So this would be through blood loss. And so hemorrhagic anemia can be um, chronic or it can be acute, okay? And so um, acute hemorrhagic anemia, this would be rapid, right, and sudden. So this would be like somebody maybe has a gunshot wound or a stab wound or, you know, they've had some sort of incident with a lawn tool, who knows what, right? So some sort of wound that is causing rapid loss of blood, okay? And so this individual would need a transfusion um, to replace that blood. That would be hemorrhagic anemia. So simply decreasing the oxygen carrying capacity because blood is being lost. It can also be uh, chronic. So this would be low not low, sorry, slow and persistent. Uh, so you have slow and persistent loss of blood. And so this could be from some sort of uh, like slow internal bleed, right? So uh, one common cause would be from a bleeding ulcer. Okay, and so um, you would want to address the root cause and then the body can kind of repair itself uh, and make more blood cells. Okay, all right, so the next category is gonna be anemia from too few blood cells, all right? So too few blood cells that are being produced or are being made, okay? So one cause for this is from iron deficiency. Uh, this is a very common cause in women. Um, so common in women, because in women uh, we have menstruation, right? And so with menstruation, you're actually losing blood and you're losing all of that iron with the blood that could be um, recycled. All right, so common in women 
uh, and following hemorrhagic anemia. All right, so following hemorrhagic anemia, so loss of blood, all right? So again, you've lost all that iron with the blood um, that would have been replaced, right? Or re recycled and reused, okay. And then there's aplastic anemia. So aplastic anemia uh, is caused by um, the bone marrow being destroyed. All right, so bone marrow destroyed. So those hematopoietic stem cells uh, are not there, right? Not present to make more blood cells. Okay, and then lastly, uh, pernicious anemia. This would result from uh, not enough B12, uh, vitamin B12 in the diet. Okay, and so uh, the function of B12 is to promote red blood cell production. And so if someone's not getting enough B12, um, they can experience anemia, right? So you're not making enough red blood cells. Uh, and so this can result from an autoimmune condition possibly that affects maybe uh, like the lining of the stomach. Um, so the stomach makes a hormone that helps you absorb B12. So that could be a problem. Uh, it could also be dietary. So it's a concern with uh, people that are vegan uh, because you need to then make sure you find a source of B12. So there's a lot of um, vegan foods being made nowadays that are fortified with B12 for that reason. Uh, so you just have to be aware of that. Okay, so it's either a problem with the diet or it could be a problem with actually absorbing the B12 um, as would be the case with the stomach and an autoimmune, autoimmune condition. Okay. And then lastly, the last type would be uh, from red blood cells actually being destroyed. And so there's two ways this could happen. Uh, one would be hemolytic anemia. So with hemolytic anemia, the red blood cells are actually just gonna burst, all right? So lytic, think lysis, right? So they're bursting. So red blood cells burst, all right? Uh, this can happen because maybe the hemoglobin is abnormal. Uh, this could happen in response to a mismatched transfusion, blood transfusion, right? So as a transfusion reaction, you could, um, they could experience hemolytic anemia. Uh, and also there are some bacteria and parasites, uh, the infections that can cause hemolytic anemia, okay. All right, so the blood cells are actually bursting. And lastly, we have sickle cell anemia. Okay, so sickle cell anemia is very interesting, all right, because it occurs from a mutation, all right, so a change in a single amino acid in one of those globin chains in one out of, there's 146 amino acids in uh, a globin chain. Okay, so that small, tiny little change, one amino acid out of 146 in a globin chain can lead to sickle cell anemia. All right, and so what happens is it causes that globin chain to misfold because it's a protein, right? So it misfolds and then it doesn't function properly. And the, the cell will end up taking on that crescent or that sickle shape that's associated with sickle cell anemia. And then the problem is that um, that could uh, stick in small capillaries because it's not very smooth like the normal red blood cells. So it can stick in little capillaries, block blood flow, um, which can be very, very painful when um, tissues aren't getting oxygen. That can be very painful, okay? All right, okay, so those are our types of anemia. All right, so that'll be the end of this video. And so next video, we'll start with blood typing and we can talk about transfusions and that kind of thing.